was a many good segues into the topic today, but uh, before I dive into that, I'm just going to introduce myself, uh, Kai Hui. I'm the uh, chief architect of OSI Digital. And what does that mean? Um, I have a utility background, about 25 years, 15 of them with BC Hydro. So I, I actually was on the other side of the fence, but decided to go on the vendor side. Uh, what we do is that we help uh, and uh, implement uh, GE's uh, analytics platform. And so we're deeply involved in the uh, Exelon implementation. So I think Bryce was right. This, this, I get to ask them questions, but of course we, we've had, I had to prepare them for the question. So we have slides because uh, there's a lot of material that we want to cover. So after the slides, uh, we will um, have a demo of the two applications that were developed there as part of the project. Um, I think it's definitely a good segue into the topic. We talked a lot of this morning about the grid modernization. Well, grid modernization does something. It drives increase in data. We all know that, big data. Um, so as part of the grid modernization, another thing comes along with that is the digital transformation of the utilities, right? The utilities continue to struggle with a vast, a vast amount of data there's a lot of valuable stuff there. You can do a lot with that data to actually affect operations, to make you more efficient. The things that you want to do, as, as the regulators talked about, and as Commissioner Lang asked, you know, mentioned something very important, is that when, does, when and who owns the data is a huge question, right? But right now, utilities are not even getting there from the customer perspective, but struggling with using it effectively. So we're gonna talk about that today. So I have my good friends, Andy and, and Ankush here. And what I'm gonna do is ask uh, them to first introduce themselves um, and then we'll go from there. So Ankush, you first. Uh, my name is Ankush. Uh, I am the Director of Infrastructure Analytics for Exelon. Um, I've been in this role for about uh, three years. Um, in uh, about three years ago, they asked me to uh, develop a grid analytics strategy at Exelon. And then uh, after we came up with the strategy and got funding for it, uh, they said, why don't you go and do it? Um, so that's what I do. Uh, and then prior to that, uh, I uh, ran an analytics practice for internal audit at Exelon. And prior to that, I worked at uh, Fannie Mae. Andy, do you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, is this working? I guess so. Uh, Andy Gay, I'm a GE. I've been with GE for 15 years. I live in Colorado. Uh, prior to that, I worked uh, for, for many years at Excel, uh, Excel Energy of uh, Colorado and uh, have been involved in a lot of utility T&D technology projects over the years. And, and I like to tell these guys, you know, after 30 plus years, you know, I was around when we built the initial geospatial projects, outage management, uh, mobility in the late 1980s, uh, mid-1980s. And when we talk about big data analytics, it has the same kind of feel to it. It's something new, exciting, it has a, you know, kind of unexplored, and the potential is huge. So hopefully, you know, as Ankush talks today about what Exelon is doing, you get some kind of feel for uh, you know, how exciting it is, kind of new and different. Thanks, Andy. Since, Ankush, you did come outside of the Pacific Northwest, maybe you can tell us a little bit about Exelon Utilities, because we know it's one of the largest in the U.S., so maybe share some, some facts and figures just for the audience here. Sure. Um, so Exelon is a Fortune 100 company, and we play in uh, the every stage of the energy business. Uh, in terms of uh, being an energy provider, we are the number one uh, zero carbon energy provider in America. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, competitive energy sales, uh, we, uh, we support about two million customers and about uh, two third of, uh, of the Fortune 100 companies. And then, uh, for in terms of transmission and delivery, which I'm a part of, uh, we are made up of uh, six utilities, uh, and uh, together uh, we serve uh, about uh, so uh, uh, so about 20,000 employees, uh, and we serve about 10 million customers, uh, 25,000 miles of combined territory. So so pretty big area. Uh, so that's a very big job, and so. Uh, are very important that our uh, employees are safe, our customers are safe, and we are sort of uh, supporting that. Thanks, Ankush. So you get the next question. Can you describe a little bit about the transformation? Uh, what are the, some of the impacts that you've seen so far in this modernization and transformation? And specifically, as we talked about, what role does data 
uh, and, and analytics play in this transformation? And describe a little bit about your uh, program that you're responsible for. Um, so when Kai asked me to sort of share uh, what these big investments uh, mean for a utility, uh, I, I sit at ComEd. I serve the six utilities, but I sit at ComEd. So I just sort of got up and walked over to one of my ComEd colleagues and asked them, hey, can you pull up a slide uh, which just shows the impact? And I think this one does a good job of that. So if you think about uh, one of our uh, big investment projects uh, started in 2007, you can s clearly see uh, big improvements of those investments. So 46% impro uh, improvement in, in, in SAFI, 71% in KD. I mean, all, all the graphs almost seem like they were made up, I mean, these, these sort of numbers. So, I mean, you know, DA improvements, uh, you know, underground cable, mainline cable improvements. I mean, these are improvements which are needed, and you can clearly see uh, with the work Comet has done and all five utilities have done this, uh, uh, tremendous improvements. Next slide. And then you can keep going down and down. So you can see uh, how the primary UR defaults have gone down. You can see the underground, uh, you know, you can sort of keep seeing stats of these sorts. So it's, it's extremely clear that when we ask for the investments in the grid, uh, these mean something and they, and they have a direct uh, relation to that. So I think you can see that. Uh, the one I know the Comet team is extremely pr proud of is these uh, CME numbers. So, uh, the, the customers who get hit the most often. Uh, and you can see uh, some of these numbers are down to uh, you know, double digits, you know, starting in the thousands and millions. So I think that's a, that's a big deal. And so as soon as we share these numbers with anybody, that sort of, uh, you know, what are you investing in, why are you investing, it's very clear. So next, next part of your question, which was, you know, how are we part of this digital transformation? I think, uh, so, uh, so I run the analytics practice for, for Grid. Uh, analytics is considered central to the digital transformation at Exelon. Uh, it's sort of uh, the enable, enablement layer of uh, how we perceive Exelon as being more, uh, more and more a customer and an energy service provider collaborating with our customers. Uh, so that's definitely our role. And then in terms of our uh, overall analytics strategy, uh, we'll deep dive into this a little bit, but uh, prior to my joining the team, uh, we were asked to think about our holistic approach to analytics. And so uh, we broke it out into these five areas, um, smart energy services, customer operations, grid, uh, AMI, and support functions. And so this sort of, uh, has been the foundation for us of how we approach analytics. Um, smart energy services, we work with Opower to centralize across our six utilities how our customers can uh, use their power better. You've all heard the Opower stories of how they've uh, done that. Um, customer operations is all about you know, 360 view of the customer, how do we do a better job of understanding our customers. Uh, grid t and uh, which Andy and I and Kai will talk more about, uh, it's, it's about uh, reliability for the grid, resiliency, and all those key things we all know about. Uh, AMI, we've already done uh, AMI deployments at most of our utilities, I think, except one of them. Uh, how do we use more of that? How do we converge on those solutions? And then we haven't launched this one yet. I'm very excited about it. Uh, it's business support. It's sort of the, the forgotten child children of all of the analytics sort of we put it into one bucket, but the ones which jump out to me are like field safety. Um, so we've been doing a lot of work at all of our utilities on safety. How do we focus in on safety driven analytics, you know, uh, safety for our employees. We're doing that, but how do we do a better job of it? So uh, those are some of our, our uh, areas of analytics. And then uh, we'll deep dive more on the grid space, but this represents our overall strategy. Thanks, Ankush. I'm going to give you a little bit of a rest there. You had to talk for a few minutes. So, Andy, from a vendor perspective, how is uh, GE as a vendor supporting this digital transformation, especially around the analytics, and maybe a little bit about what GE is doing with, with analytics and the platforms that they're putting out? Well, uh, thanks, Kai. I'm, I'm going to try to do that, but I can't compete with the five-minute pitches at lunchtime. I, I just <laughs> am not smart enough to do that. But if you go to the next slide, to give it a little bit of an idea. Um, so obviously, GE's got a lot of uh, um, operational software, um, GIS software, analytics. Uh, and what we're doing, we have a project called North Star. And <clears throat> it's bringing together the, the user interface, the, the look and feel of those products, uh, bringing together the actual uh, platform those products run on, 
the actual model, which we'll see is very important to analytics, is having a, you know, kind of a contiguous model that covers all those things. So we're building this, you know, this is a work in progress. And you can see uh, on one end is the analytics um, applications where I work on, uh, that I work on with uh, Exelon. And also um, the data fabric layer is part of it and the model that uh, all the uh, enterprise systems, and just as an aside, Exelon's got over 120 enterprise uh, systems that feed into the uh, data fabric layer that we build our analytics on. And this just shows you an example at a very high level how that all could come together. Obviously, um, there, there's third-party ecosystems that already exist that, you know, all of our customers. So that uh, ingress, egress of data, you know, we use a um, canonical data model, uh, a SIM, uh, extended SIM model to enable trading data with the systems that are already in place. So it's, it's kind of an end-to-end -end solution, but it also has to coexist, obviously, with whatever uh, legacy systems or whatever projects customers got in play. Next slide. Next slide. And, and here is a specific slide on the analytics. And you can see, you know, same fit. It's got, got the uh, data fabric, the enterprise systems that are input, uh, the actual applications that Ankush is going to talk about and, and Kai will demo a little bit later. But one thing I should say is, although uh, Exelon has purchased a platform and applications, they're also very concerned about opening up uh, you know, here we've combined time series data with enterprise data, with static data. It's, it's, it's complicated and, and kind of wonderful, but what they want to do, as you can see, they want to uh, enable their data scientists, their citizen developers, their engineers to have access to their analytics and create new ones, modify the ones that we give them. So it has to be open-ended enough and, you know, the ability to use whatever tools that the um, end users want to use, develop their own uh, analytics, and combine them with what we're delivering. So that's, I know it's very important to Exelon is to enable that as well, to deliver the use cases that we're going to talk about later. So perfect segue, Ankush. Now maybe you can a little bit, uh, describe some of the use cases that Exelon programs are tackling now and in the future. So we came up with this picture uh, two years ago, and we keep making it fancier. I think this, this, latest, this latest version, we made all the wires green. <laughs> that, that, that was our thing. We made, made the wire screen now. Anyways, uh, when uh, uh, when we talk about our grid T&D sp uh, scope, our, our our talking point here is that uh, you know with AMI meters, with reclosers, with DA devices, with all sort of sensors, uh, we now have a lot more data. And so the grid T&D scope is about taking um, that uh, the 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 scalar data which we had for uh, for the T side and bringing in similar high high resolution image uh, high resolution data uh, for the distribution side and so we have a long portfolio big portfolio of uh, of analytics here uh, to improve reliability reduce operational costs and uh, reduce system risk if you show the next slide so um, what we did was we um, two years ago when we started this journey for grid came up uh, worked with our employees to come up with a portfolio of use cases what became very clear to us was doing one use case would not be economical the amount of data required for a single use case and the benefits one use case gave you would just not make sense and so uh, we, we we came up with this portfolio and the ones you see in green are the ones which we decided to bundle up together as our uh, wave one and two and so um, we were able to showcase the benefits and the cost, and uh, the business case just made a lot of, lot, lot of sense because the same data can be used for many use cases. And as we build these five, we call them foundational, uh, we believe that the remaining use cases can be delivered at a much lower cost because the data already exists in a centralized system. So, uh, so we think the portfolio piece of this is very important uh, and foundational to our strategy. So we're gonna do a live demo, I believe, later. Yeah. Uh, I'll just sort of run through a few slides just to give us a quick view of some of the um, the analytics we want to do. So uh, this was one of my favorite use cases. We 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 came up with it uh, two years ago. Uh, again, uh, was uh, our meteorologist talked about how we respond to storm. And when I say storm, it doesn't necessarily mean storm. Storm just means adverse weather conditions. So it can be floods, can be anything. And so when you think about a weather condition. Uh, most utilities get weather reports um, from 
uh, a Schneider or an MNT or anything of that sort. And when they get those weather reports, they're usually um, very broad. Uh, they have a few words, a few numbers on them, and they, are, and they cover a broad region. So uh, ComEd, which is our utility in, uh, in the Chicago area in Illinois, uh, we, uh, we break out our territory into seven weather regions, the big ones um, shown in the different colors on the left. And so our vision with the storm readiness use case was to say, uh, with all of the changes which have come in the, uh, in the weather space, we know the weather much more precisely. So can't we do a better job of using that precise high resolution weather and using that with machine learning uh, for, for, so for each of the boxes on the right of the slide, uh, we now know what the weather is, what the temperature is, what the wind speed is, what the wind gust is, what the temperature is and, and all, the, all the predictions on that. And so for each of those boxes, we also know what our assets are, exactly where they are. And we also know in those boxes, how those assets reacted over the last 10 years. So we proposed that we would, we would build a machine learning model which took our historical outage uh, and the weather for those high resolution boxes and could we do a better job of predicting which assets will break or fail because of weather. So that was our, that was our sort of statement pie in the sky uh, piece and we'll show how we're bringing this to life with, uh, with GE and OSI. Um, so you know, uh, key to this use case is uh, we can do a better job of, uh, with, with the weather, we can uh, target uh, damage clearly if this works, and then we can put our crews in the right places, right next to the circles, rather than you know, guessing where they would be. Uh, and this obviously has a big impact on KD because you'd be better prepared and things of that sort. So, so this is a very fascinating use case. We'll show you some screenshots, we'll, we'll do that demo. Uh, next one, uh, Kai will demonstrate this one. Uh, again, uh, we all know we don't talk about it too much, but we all know that uh, the data, uh, underlying, the underlying, underlying data, there's a lot of it, but uh, because we have not used it to the extent that we want to, we don't know how good or bad it is. And so we made a very strategic decision early on that we would not worry about how bad the data is until we get to the point where we are trying to solve this. We believe strongly, and it's been proved that this is right, that we have enough data which we don't use today that we can build analytics on it. We don't need to make it perfect to do analytics, which we haven't done before. So with, with that supposition in mind, um, this is a foundational use case network connectivity where we are going to uh, transfer our network, network connectivity model into the GE Predix platform and use that to predict where our data could be incorrect. So using the network connectivity model to predict that a meter to transformer or a transformer to feeder connection, uh, what's listed in GIS or our SIM system might be incorrect because of what we are seeing with the network connectivity model. So Kai will demonstrate uh, some of that work. I think it's pretty fascinating. Uh, and, and we'll show you a few examples of uh, you know, how you can predict it, how you can see it in real time and things of that sort. Last slide, I think. Uh, and then uh, we won't demonstrate this today, but uh, I love to use this slide because it was built like two, three years ago by an engineer, uh, you know, who was, who was asked to, uh, who was asked to like put together like what the next generation of, uh, of the asset health process looks like. And so when BIDA came along uh, two years ago, the, this, this slide was the first slide which came to us like, this is what we want. Uh, and so uh, all I did in this slide was I added the word predix to it. Uh, you know, so we are, Everybody knows what we want. We just need a way to do it. So the, the messaging here was, uh, we have all the PM, CM history. We're using it well today. We have all the AMI data. We're using them in silos. How do we pull all of this together, the static data, the dynamic data, and build uh, asset health scores so that we can do a better job of uh, determining uh, our asset health in more real time and predicting when assets are failing, do move away from preventive maintenance and go into more risk-based uh, time um, no time based. So I think uh, I love this slide and I always use it, always use it whenever I'm presenting. Thanks, Ankush. So the next two questions are for Andy. Uh, so Andy, uh, from a vendor perspective now, how has GE been involved in this T&D digital transformation? Well, at, at Exelon specifically, uh, there's three things. One is um, the platform. So we provide the platform that, that Ankush described and it's all cloud-based. The scalability is very important. I think, um, give you an example, the, the 10 million AMI meters that Ankush mentioned uh, generate half a terabyte a day. 
of data that, to your point, <laughs> that is, uh, I mean, is ripe for uh, providing, you know, conditions on the network, but harvesting that and making something useful out of it is the challenge. So we provide the platform and the uh, analytics model, the extended SIM model that we use, and and then, uh, you know, quite frankly, on the application, uh, the analytics applications, we run the gamut of, you know, very mature asset health, asset performance management uh, technology to the network, uh, uh, network topology that we have is very mature. But we work very collaboratively with Exelon and their data scientists and their business SMEs on things like storm readiness and outage prediction and historical outage uh, because, you know, that where we bring value to each other. You know, technology and, and business SMEs along with uh, the people on the front lines actually doing the work. And it's kind of interestingly, we, we had a workshop with some of their uh, end users on asset health at ComEd. And we discovered over and above those 120 enterprise inputs, there was at least 30 what, what we call rogue databases that had valuable data on their assets that are not cataloged or even necessarily used outside of the, you know, one or two people that create it. Um, so I'm jumping ahead a little bit to the lessons learned, but, you know, that was one of the things that, that I found quite interesting. So it's really those three things that, you know, we're, we're working with Exelon and what we bring to it. Yeah. So now that you talked about that, so Andy, you get the next question again is, um, so what are you, what are some of the challenges you're, you see um, Exelon and others that are, uh, utilities are facing with this digital transformation. You kind of mentioned a little bit about the data, but broadly, what are some other areas of this challenges that they're facing? Well, you know, there, there's the traditional do nothing option, right? So, you know, <laughs> there was a really interesting uh, panel early this morning with, with the uh, plenary session about business cases. And, you know, is it inevitable that I have to do something with this data to improve my operations and, and become more efficient? And yeah, it is, but that doesn't mean I can wave a wand and go get funding to do an analytics project. So one of the things that, that we learned with, with Exelon was building that business case. One of the things that was very powerful is qualitative benefits. And how many years has it been? You know, I, started, I did my first business case in the 80s. And in those days, we could t you know, talk about qualitative benefits and you know, safety and I'm going to avoid a fatality or whatever. But... That one, you know, that the ability to do that, I think, uh, you know, wrongly or rightly, kind of gone away over the last several years, and now it's back. And I think that's valid. I think when you when you talk about something so strategic, and so significant, and how this is going to change the way the grid works, I think those qualitative benefits are, are uh, completely valid. And I think, you know, I guess you would agree, can help get over the hump in terms of uh, providing the funding and and the the, the sponsorship which, by the way, is extremely significant and excellent. I mean, they've got all the way to the, the, the C, CEO is, you know, very supportive of this project. Um, so all those things, you know, kind of contribute, but they could all be stumbling blocks at, at uh, so other places. Thanks, Andy. So, Ankush, now it's your turn. From your perspective, what are some of the challenges that Exelon has faced in this digital transformation and then some of the lessons learned, how, how you've overcome some of them? So I think Andy just talked about it, right? Uh, one of the biggest challenges I think we overcome, and this is sort of lessons learned from many, many projects we've done, uh, specifically in analytics, is Andy talked about uh, the top-down support. Uh, I, I took that for granted uh, when I joined the project. When, when I joined the project, my leadership, uh, when they hired me, they, taught, they talked about, oh, this is a big project, we have leadership support. I, I thought that you know, everybody has leadership support. Obviously, everybody has leadership support. But um, for, for something, of, something of this scale, uh, and I'm just talking about grid right now, you can have similar people talking about customer and AMI and business support. Uh, it's, it's sort of very, very important. Uh, so our, our CEO, Chris Crane, you know, a few years ago, uh, talked about the importance of analytics, and this was a mandate from him uh, to, you know, put together this program and help envision it. Uh, our CFO of Exelon Utilities uh, owns the program, uh, so sort of has a very sort of straight line to the finance piece of it. And uh, the CEO of Exelon Utilities uh, gets an update on this program every month. So, I mean, it's not one of the biggest programs at Exelon, for sure, but it definitely is seen as a very transformational program and gets that attention. 
Uh, so I think that's huge, uh, you know, ne definitely needed. Uh, the other thing I, I'll say is, and we, and we have seen really good benefits from this, is people, our employees kept telling us, like for our big projects, you keep hiring outside vendors. You know, you, you go and hire you know, consulting companies to tell you what you're doing right or wrong. And so very early on, we sort of had this uh, guiding principle which said, big initiatives like this one should be led by employees. Should there, it's the employee's vision which should be coming through, through your, your uh, consulting network. And so I think that's been really good. I think, Andy, you can, you can sort of uh, agree with that. So all of our workshops are, uh, you know, filled with our experts, uh, and then we definitely have a lot of consultants, obviously, but they are sort of supporting our vision. Uh, they're supplementing what we are asking them to do. Uh, we know that our subject matter experts, our engineers, do have day jobs, so our consultants are, are supporting them, doing the heavy lifting for them. Uh, but I think that's been huge for but, BIDA. But they make the decisions. They make I think that's very exactly. critical. Exactly. They make the decisions. They own, they own it. And so even me, for example, uh, you know, uh, I own the grid analytics strategy, but I am relying very, very heavily on the engineers to sign off on the key things which only they know about. So I think that's, that's been huge. Uh, as you see some of our demos, uh, you know, having a meteorologist actually co-develop this platform with GE, it'll come through very clearly to you. Uh, that it's the engineers, it's, the, it's our employees who are doing this, I think that's huge. Uh, I probably can go on and on, but probably not. So I'll give Andy the last word because we want to leave some time for the demo. So from an implementer, from a platform provider, what are your, what are your lessons learned? Well, I, I, I got a second what, what Ankush has said. So you can imagine a company that consists of six different utilities. You know, this is also a convergence project. And, and getting that standing business me team has been really, you know, not just educational, but also really gratifying because um, we've been to some meetings where, you know, uh, some, some of their business me's from their different utility companies are actually introducing themselves. You know, they, they've talked on the phone a hundred times, but the opportunity to work face to face and kind of, you know, come to agreement on how they're going to work in the future, I, I, I find that very gratifying. And, and I guess the other big lesson learned is um, ingesting all that data, bringing all, you know, marshalling all that data from 120 plus systems. It's a team sport, right? You know, we're part of it. Uh, business me's are part of it. IT is part of it. Uh, system integrator is part of it. Uh, you can't have a traditional vendor customer relationship because there's a lot of vendors involved across the realm. Uh, you just have to collaborate and, and everybody's got to be able to come to the table and kind of just make it work even even if you have to go you know above and beyond uh, you've got you've got to uh, all work together to make it happen and bring all of that data together and um, make it useful that, that's been a it's been a huge challenge but we knew it was coming but it's uh, it's a lesson learned. there we go so uh, one of the things that you can see here the mixture of uh, operational systems and asset and time series data and how all that has to fit into uh, the analytics um, semantic model. Uh, I think another you know, part of that, one of the things that we've done to make this simpler is automated testing, automated schema testing, uh, 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 running the ingestions before you know, all the data is ready. Again, you've got six utilities data coming together. We might only get one. Uh, we might get data from ComEd because of proximity. Uh, and, and we just, you know, you ingest it and see what kind of problems you have. It's not like uh, something that you can, tr like traditionally you would build the model, ingest the data, build the machine. It's more incre incremental than that because of all these different kinds of inputs. Can I add something real quick? Yeah. I think this picture to me tells me why <coughs> utilities will always have a space in like the future of the grid. When you think about all of these systems and the time and effort it takes to put all this together and the engineering expertise behind this, um, you know, all the innovators in the world can, can take on some part of the, the chain, but I think it's the utilities which, which, which have that end-to-end -end view, and we definitely look to collaborate with innovators. We are innovators ourselves, but I think this is a great way to show how there will always be space for us to innovate, co-innovate with people and, and, and deliver the benefits for the grid and the customer. 
thank you for both of you. We have about 20 minutes, so we'll take about 15 minutes to do some demo. So what we're going to show you um, is what we call proof of value demo. Um, that was the, the hurdles that Exelon put us through. So as part of the team, we have to take their business case, gather the requirements, and show enough in the proof of value for them to buy off and sign off that, yes, that their sponsors agree that there's value in delivering this full use case. So if we can't get past the proof of value hurdle, that basically comes off the table. So what we're gonna show you is two proof of value, storm readiness uh, and also network connectivity. So let me tee that up because Ankush is gonna demo. Then there's one other thing uh, other than proving the business case, it's also showing that you can move quickly, right? And, and get data and bring parties together and do it relatively quickly. The proof of value for storm readiness here was uh, there's three predictive models here at play. The first one is an outage prediction. So when is an outage going to occur uh, based on the weather information uh, and the assets? Second one then is damage assessment model. So understand what damage is going to be the result of this, how big is the impact. And that leads to the third one, which is basically estimated time of restoration. So you need all three of those things because that's the ultimate goal is you want to reduce your, your, your metrics uh, you, but also want to put the crew at the right place and deal with the right ones first. So that's uh, the first POV was outage prediction. Uh, the next one that's built is going to be the damage uh, prediction and then uh, estimated time of restoration with enough widgets for the operators to, to change parameters, uh, whether they have crews coming in from other areas, uh, uh, the, the type of crews they need, what type of equipment they need, all those are factors that can uh, uh, affect that uh, estimated time of restoration model. Cool. So uh, on the left-hand side, uh, you have the damage assessment uh, by high resolution, which, which, we sh which I showed you in that graph sort of uh, done here. On the right, um, they have the same thing, but just the weather. So right now it's set for cloud cover. You can pick uh, any of the uh, weather uh, inputs coming in. So you know, I've never done this before, uh, but it seems interesting. So I'll just call uh, rain. So they've sort of got, uh, got the weather um, for the last few years uh, in there. And then uh, I'm just gonna press play and, and run you through a simulation. What you're gonna see is um, a, for a storm, is, uh, this is going to be a 72-hour uh, forecast, and it's going to update every four hours. So you'll sort of see uh, this what's going to happen, and then I'll, I'll, and I'll walk you through what will just happen. So you can sort of see how, with every flash, the damage assessment is changing, because it's predicting that there'll be different types of damage. Uncle, I just want to add one that, is that all the outage data that was given to us, uh, half the data was used to train the model and the other half of the data was to then to test the accuracy of the model, right? Because what you want to do is uh, make sure that the model is actually going to predict an outage uh, with a sufficient accuracy uh, to, to then do the damage assessment. So that... We, we used five years of history yeah. to train the model, and then we, we ran the model, what, 2016, 2017? Yeah. And what we find, like, 75% accuracy of what the model predicted versus what the actual outcomes were in terms of damage and outage. So it was pretty good for the for a POV. So the, uh, the top left, you understand probably, is the damage. So you're seeing it changing every time, which, which shows uh, that it's so region specific. You saw, probably saw each dot changing. Uh, this one I like a lot. Uh, it's the x-axis is uh, 0 to 700. And what we did was we gave each of these grids a number. So if you look on the right, left, it's, it starts with 100 and sort of goes diagonally uh, to about uh, 700. And so what you were seeing was left to right is our territory and top to bottom is time. So as time was going on, you could sort of see uh, how the storm was coming. And so the blue is good, it's, it's a blue, uh, blue sky. And in the middle, you were, you were noticing this is the Chicago area, uh, the storm was hitting the most, sort of what you kind of call the lake effect um, sort of thing. And so, uh, you know, if I, so this would be what, what we demonstrated, this is real data, what a operator would be able to see going forward. 
uh, and they would be able to see how the overall storm is going to affect our territory over time. So the bottom left graph is sort of showing the risk factor going up, going down, sort of simulating. And then you can also pick a township. So if I want to see township number 452, I can sort of go there and uh, pick, pick a particular township. And I can specifically see that township's profile. So imagine this sort of a tool being available to the to the to our operators. So they're very excited about this tool. And as Andy was mentioning, uh, you know, this is good UI. But what was behind it was we gave them 2012. We gave GE 2012 to uh, 2016 data, and so they trained their model on that, like we wanted. And then 2007, 2016 and 17 we did not provide the outages, and so they predicted that, and they had over 80% uh, prediction, uh, pretty good. And the AUC curve uh, for the data scientists in the group was uh, above 0.8, so, so very, very uh, convincing. And so, uh, very happy with this result. I'll real, really quick show you, uh, so it's not only focused on the uh, operators, but you can also uh, have like a, um, somebody who just wants to know how good is the model doing. Uh, there are also views which then show you uh, for a particular storm, like how good were we at our predictions. So you can sort of go into the model and say, okay, we were good, we were good. Uh, true positive, false positive, false negative. And you can see that over the territory. So this is sort of helping us. Uh, with the proof of value, we knew we wouldn't be perfect at it. But we wanted to show that we now have the tools in place to do a better job of this. And so imagine our reliability experts having access to this, and now um, we spend the proof of value just doing machine learning, basic machine learning. Now when they are going to collaborate with our engineers, they're going to tell them things like, uh, you know, 35 miles per hour actually does this to our asset. Adding that layer to it will make it even more powerful. So we were very happy with our results in terms of, uh, you know, quickly, quickly in like a month being able to demonstrate this. And now we're going to do full production uh, through 2020 where we really put in the effort and bring this to life. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to, to Kai to do his uh, network connectivity demo. So let me describe a little bit about network connectivity, right? So everyone who delivers electrons has a connectivity grid. Um, the challenge is that uh, it's never 100% accurate, typically. Y you're dealing with field situations where they have to switch a transformer from one phase to another because there's a customer outage. There could be issues that are meters are assigned in CIS that are assigned to the incorrect transformer and things like that. So data-driven errors, uh, field-generated errors, there's always a process to update that in GIS. But, um, you know, utilities, I've, I've heard, and uh, go through a cleansing exercise to update their connectivity model, make sure it's accurate, you know, every few years. But we talked about data-driven utility, data transformation, digital transformation. Well, a utility already has, if they have an EMI system, leverage that data. They have an OMS, leverage that data. They have an EAM, Enterprise Asset Management, customer information system. You bring all those data elements together, you correlate them, you start applying uh, algorithms to that data, uh, uh, algorithms based on distance. We know that from a physics or electrical perspective, you can't have a, a meter to a transformer over X, right? It just doesn't make sense. Um, you also look at my AMI meters, how many behind a transformer are, be are behaving the same way, whether it's an outage and so on. So there's some standard algorithms that you can start to apply. And so you build a, 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 on the platform these algorithms which then can be configured, tweaked to drive a, a recommendation ultimately of a mismatch. But then as you drive a recommendation, also drive a recommendation for a suggested uh, transformer that it belongs to using the similar algorithm. So, uh, we've used GIS data uh, to look at land base. Uh, these, this will be in the full use case. We look at voltage profile data. We look at uh, consumption data. Uh, all the data that actually the utility are already collecting. So why not use it to help with uh, improving the connectivity, uh, the accuracy of the connectivity. So what you see on the screen here is the analytics are run. It dumps it into this what we call a workbench. And the can operator... I, can, I, can, I, um, can I interrupt you just a sec? To point out, this this is Baltimore, so for the POVs, we use one of uh, one of the six utilities. In the case of storm readiness, it was ComEd. In the case of network connectivity, it was Baltimore Gas and Electric. So again, it's real data. You can see the geography in Chesapeake Bay, whatever. But um, that, that also was very important to get a very focused POV, getting the data that was accessible quickly. 
Okay, thanks, Andy. That, yeah, so, so what I'm going to do is going to focus on, on distance uh, because that, there's a really good example of this, right? So what we want is to look for something that's greater than 0.8%, 80% confidence. Now, the, what we're also going to do later on is automate that, right? So Ankush says do the demo. All right, so I'm going to distance confidence of, of, uh, of, of, of 0.8. I'm just going to, I'm going to pick this... Um, this mismatch here, and the first screen you see is just analysis of variance. So we, we look at the different algorithms. This one is distance, this outage and voltage that was used in the POV, and comes up with a confidence score. Um, this gives us an indication of what we think is the, the, the probability of the mismatch, and then when we start to look at that, we then look at the recommendations. Uh, so the recommendations prov uh, provides three recommendations, and the important thing here to note is the transformer ID that it's recommending it. Uh, so keep in mind 48. Um, these are the three recommendations. And what you can do is an operator can review that. Uh, here's the meter in question. You can uh, right click and show the current transformer that it's connected to. So this is the, the one that it thinks is a mismatch. You can right click on that transformer and show the connected meters here. So you can see that. The, the meter pattern uh, around the transformer doesn't really uh, support this meter being uh, associated with that. Um, what I'm going to do is quickly reset the map, um, and then you can show the three suggested transformers. Just going to zoom in a bit here, and you can do is hover over this. So the transformer that it recommended as a first recommendation was 48. Um, you can right click here and show the connected meters here. So very much the meter in question seems to fit around that area of interest, uh, saying that this is the right transformer uh, that I belong to. What you can do is, because this is based on Google Maps as part of the platform, you have the ability to go down to street view. So this is what the operators were doing, is using street view to go look at the secondary lines to see if what was found was accurate, or did that recommendation make sense? Right, so um, I'm going to go down to here is that there should be, um, you can take a look at the street view, look at the secondary lines, and identify whether the recommendation makes sense or not. Um, in this one here, the case, it, it was a, a correct recommendation, and, um, and so you're able to, to, to verify that without having to go out in the street, go out and uh, you know, roll a truck to look at that. So once you're happy with that recommendation, uh, you can accept it. We talked about data, right? So as part of look, using the data, we also visualize the data. Uh, so here, we can see that this is the voltage profile for this period of time, for this meter in question. And you can turn on the other uh, voltage profiles for the meters that are associated with that transformer. In the new interface, you can actually go and change the transformer and look at the other recommended ones to look at the profile. So it's another spot check of looking at uh, the voltage pattern. You can go look at the AMI event history. Um, you can go look at the AMI outage information. So in this case here, the meter in question was the only one that suffered an AMI outage. Uh, so points to the fact that either it was a, um, a you know, there was a, a work order associated with this one. For the POV, we don't have that because this was p potentially just a single outage. But if it's not, then really this meter uh, is not behaving like the rest of the meters behind that transformer, which indicates a, a, uh, you know, a, a really a suspect relationship. So that's what we've done is the PO, POV was focusing on meter to transformer. For the full use case, we're dealing with transformer to feeder slash section to phase, right? So that's really high value stuff for the utilities to have that accurate because a correct or better network connectivity uh, information is foundational for driving all the other use cases. If we want to uh, assess damage, you have to have the right information before you can properly do that. If you want to do outage prediction, you want to do all this other stuff, having as, as accurate as possible network connectivity grid allows you to get value from those other use cases. And, so, and I'll just add that um, <clears throat> the first deployment, we did this for the proof of value, uh, so we you know, GE did their work, they, they thought it looked really good, uh, and we asked our engineers to use the Google Maps and their knowledge to test this. We got 10% hit rate, meaning uh, only 10% of the predictions were accurate. 
90% were wrong. And you're like, what the heck? Oh my God, our first proof of value. This is the worst thing ever. And so, uh, you know, GE came over, we sat, and then they spent time with our engineers, I think uh, one week. And then it went up from 10% to 70%. So again, I think that that collaboration of having your engineers work with the data scientists, work with the platform, I think is what's really showing value here. Is like you, you, like I mean, you can't just do this based on analytics alone. You need that expertise to do it. So I was really pleased when we went from 10 to 70 because I thought our first proof of value so, would, so would be we, a big though. failure. Yeah. So were we. Yeah. I, I think what we found was that we put too much confidence in voltage. And we found out that voltage was not a very good indicator. It's secondary at best. Because what we found was that voltage uh, patterns, even if the meter's connected to the same transformer and there's a secondary bus that they're further away, they all, all behave differently. And there's so much variation that we couldn't rely on that to drive a, a, a good analytics score. So we've downgraded the value of voltage as an example, working with the, with the engineers at, at Exelon. So one last thing is it's a bit of a process because you're showing how you could evaluate the recommendations. Ultimately, when the, the people responsible for the network connectivity have enough confidence that it's recommend, the algorithms are working correctly and giving the right recommendation, most of the time, this can be automated. It's not a perpetual uh, job for life. You know, you, you validate the algorithm's work, you tweak them, and ultimately, you can automate this and use it only you know, situational, situationally when something gets kicked out that you got to go look at. And, and I think uh, this is a foundational use case. So you saw how we have brought in voltage, outage data, and network connectivity. Uh, the next thing which GE is working on really looks really good is, uh, Andy's working on it, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, you can actually demonstrate the network connectivity diagram. You can see uh, how each asset is connected and you can do analytics on that. As soon as that, as soon as you see that, you sort of see the future of that for outage prediction, historical outage, because you can start building out that network tree. So that's why I think the, the foundation of this use case is just tremendous. Thank you. I know we've got three minutes left and I know Bryce is ready to come up. So we've run out of time for questions. So we'll be available upstairs when we go out for drinks. So if you guys want to just stop by and chat with us, we'll be happy to do that. But I want to hand it back over to, to Bryce now. So I uh, want to thank again all of our supporters. Hopefully you've met with many of them over the course of the day. They'll be here tomorrow as well. Um, thanks again to BC Hydro for really uh, rolling out the carpet and, and helping us make this possible. Uh, I can't list every name, but I'm going to get through my first group. So Autogrid Avista DVI, thank you. Ecobee Mbala Itron, Opus One, OSI Digital. Portland General, Seattle City Light and Census. So those groups, thank you very much, and all the others. So without further ado, we're all here. We're still hanging around. Hopefully you're planning to stick around for the social. We haven't announced it earlier. So top floor of this building, it's the 19th floor. Hopefully the elevators will work pretty smoothly for us to get up there. We've got the whole floor. It's going to be a beautiful view. Hopefully we'll see a great sunset. Uh, and come join us for a uh, time of gathering and mixing and mingling. We know we've had a pretty tight agenda all day, so we've got plenty of time up there this evening. So thank you all.